Well, good morning, Columbia Grove. We're so glad to see you today. If you're in the building, we invite you to stand as we start our, our worship service. And if you're behind that screen, we would just invite you to worship with us as, as we sing a song that, that um, Andrew wrote for the women's retreat that we did the, right before the COVID shutdown. And so this, we've only done this song a couple of the times, but it's, it's just near and dear to my heart. So I hope you enjoy it too. Good morning. <laughs> Something great. 
Hey, it's so good to see you all here. Please have a seat. My name is Andrew. Uh, just a thrill to uh, be here today with all of you and uh, seeing folks joining us online. But each week, each week, more and more folks coming back in the space. It's kind of fun to see things slowly open up. And even, uh, even the regulations are changing a little bit. So just, a, just kind of a quick update in terms of how those things affect the church. We're under the same rules as Costco, as Lowe's, as the... If there was a Kmart, we'd, you know, but it's basically whatever you do in any store, those are the same rules here. So just please uh, do that. Yeah, we're law and order folks. So do whatever's the right thing to do, given those situations. So that's what that is. And we need to give another big shout out to the yard sale yesterday. You might have seen some of the pictures on the screen, um, you know, as you were coming in from the yard sale. Um, the last I heard, now I'll, I'll, pro I'll probably have an update a little bit later. It was more than $3,000 raised. <laughs> More than three, so uh, which is great. This team just knocked it out of the park. So uh, I don't, I don't even see Ann Benedum in the room. Oh, there she is. Would you stand up now? Now Ann assembled an amazing team, but I'm amazed that she is upright today. And and any anyone else? So you, so John must have fed you all pretty good last night. You got your energy back. That was good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Of course, we're also thrilled now to be able to have Children's Church again. We've got an amazing team. So um, why don't we uh, pray for our kids as we get ready to dismiss them so that if you're sitting next to somebody who's about to head off to Children's Church or you wish they'd go off to Children's Church, just put a hand on their shoulder, pray for them, and let's uh, bless them. And Marsha and her team is going to take it from there. They're just doing an outstanding job. Lord, thanks for our kids. God, thank you for the things that you are doing in them and through them, the lessons that they're learning. And Lord, we just pray that you would just be powerfully at work through those children, through those teachers. Keep them safe, Lord, and use this time to just ground them in who they are in you. When we know who we, that we, who we are in you, Jesus, we're free, we're complete. We just sang about that, and those things are so profoundly true. So, Lord, we pray that blessing on them in Jesus' name. Amen. So kids, head on off to Children's Church. This is our time to greet one another. So uh, we'll also put some social meetings up, greetings up on the screen. We have folks joining us from Florida, from Penticton. Uh, but we, we got our Bonaventure crew online, I think. We've got our Freestone, our Freestone family online. So um, uh, folks all around the valley and all around the state and in some cases all around the world uh, joining us there. So, but take a moment, um, greet one another in whatever way is appropriate. Give them a high five, give them some moose antlers, um, do a fist bump, do something, um, yell hey you across the room. Just let somebody know that you're glad to see them and we're going to get back into uh, singing in about 30 seconds, a minute. So be friendly, be friendly. you to just continue in worship whether that's seated or standing whatever whatever is the most comfortable posture for you during worship we just want you to we just want you to commune with God and if, if sitting um, is the most comfortable way for you then then you are totally welcome to do that if standing is your way to worship then we invite you to stand but we just want to continue in that in that spirit of worship as Ian leads us in this next song I 
morning, Columbia Grove. I'd like to welcome to church, whether that is online or in person. And thank you so much for joining us in worship today. I'll try to make it through this. I'm a little emotional after singing Waymaker. It's one of my favorite, favorite songs. Um, but I just have a few things that I'd like to um, pray over today. And so let us all join together in prayer and bow our heads. And we just say thank you, Father God, for who you are and your ever-enduring love and grace with us and patience with us as we, as we muddle our way through lives and um, our emotions and everything, Lord. And I just ask that you be with our graduates, Father. What an amazing thing that they have accomplished. And they are beginning, they are at the very beginning of their journey. And I just ask that you bless them in their new beginnings. And along with that, as a parent, I know that it is really hard to release our children into the world and help them, you know, to be their guides and to give them the words to proclaim over their children. Heal their hearts as we release them, Lord. Remember that your grace is sufficient. And we just ask that and we pray that for um, parents as well. And over the graduates, Jeremiah 29, 11 is pretty common. Um, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, but to give you a future and a hope. And I would also like to add to that, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. That's what is so amazing about God is that you we are able to seek him and find him when we search for him with all of our hearts. And we just thank you for opening doors for them, Lord, to have friends, to bring opportunities to serve, and that they can be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ, just as Christ did, and God forgave us in Ephesians 4:32. And Lord, I lift up Mary Clark as she is healing from back surgery. And I just heard the word knitting, Father, over her when you are knitting together her body. And I just pray Psalms 139, 13, you created my innermost being and you knit me together in my mother's womb. And I just pray over um, pain, Father, as I know, uh, I just wanna ask for relief for her that you, and we just thank you for providing the doctors and surgeons and medicines to help her along the recovery for that. And I also pray for the Letts family and the Eimer family as they mourn the passing of Susan Let mother Becky. And I also lift up Brandy Clark as she has lost her father suddenly. And I know that those leave wounds, Father. And I just pray for you to be close to the brokenhearted as you are in Psalms 34. And you save those who are crushed in spirit. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And I know it's so difficult to, when we lose a loved one, that we have all this love and we have nowhere for it to go. And I just ask that you bring opportunities for us to just pour that out into different areas of our life. And I pray for the aching and against the enemy to not steal our joy, but to focus that on you, Lord. And I just want to lift up um, Andrew, Father, as he is getting ready to speak your word and to help us to... Um, really discover our emotions and, and I just thank you for guiding him on this walk and allowing him to share his heart and your word and um, we just ask that you use him um, just to move us Lord help our eyes to be open our hearts and our spirit to be aligned with you Father and we just thank you um, for our shepherd and we ask that you guide him and guard him Father in Jesus name we pray Amen Thanks so much, Heather. We've got a couple of sick members of the uh, worship team today. There's a stomach bug going around. We all took our masks off, and then we all, you know, everybody gets the stomach bug. So how that works. So uh, do pray for them. But even as a, as a smaller team, they're able to, to pull some good stuff off, right? Just, I'm just so thrilled, so grateful. We have such amazing people here at the church. 
Um, so for the next four weeks, I want us to spend some time with something that for many of us we were told is not very important, which is why it is actually so important. See, some of us were raised in um, kind of family cultures where we were told that, um, or whether that's directly or maybe inadvertently, that our emotions are either unimportant or maybe suspicious or something that we just don't really talk about very much. Now, that was at least to a certain degree, that was at least true in, in my family of origin. Uh, I have fantastic parents. They're actually watching right now. So yeah, I got, they're going to keep me honest. You know, you just watch the Facebook feed and you'll know <laughs> if, I've, if I've stepped out of bounds here. But I mean, growing up, we just didn't talk about our feelings uh, all that much. And as I get to know, as I got to know my grandparents, I think I have a better understanding now of why for them it wasn't really all that normal. Because, of course, my grandparents, um, you know, they, uh, you know, my, my grandpa Ira, he was with the U.S. Army in World War II. He was a medic there. My, my, uh, my grandpa Frank was with the British Army, again, in World War II. And they're starting and building their families right after World War II. There's a reason why these folks were called the best generation or the greatest generation, right? They had a lot to do. You know, they, they've just finished beating back fascism and imperialism, and now they're having to face communism and rebuild all of, like, all of the, the structures of the Western world. They didn't have time to talk about your feelings, sit around and kumbaya and a campfire and the whole thing. Um, so, so they didn't really talk about uh, their, their emotions very much, and I think that's why maybe my parents picked up on that. Who, who, I'm not going to make, oh, you make you put up your hands too much, but you've, you know, you've got you know, some, some of that kind of thing. Your emotions weren't a really uh, big, big deal. And yet, it's funny, even when we were told that our emotions aren't that important, they're still there, right? And, and you know, even when, um, you know, maybe you're not talking about your feelings, there's some stuff that gets stuffed down. There's some stuff that gets swept under the rug. I grow up in a family that's got lumpy rugs. You know, like there is stuff. Under and and from time to time, uh, these things they'll just kind of burst out. Now, um, my my dad uh, is uh, you know raised in England. He's the uh, the epitome of the British stiff upper lip. You some of you have met my dad. He's like Mr. Cool and collected and amazing. And he had three boys. <laughs> I'm the oldest of th those three boys. He's Mr. Cool and collected, and he's still got buttons. We found them. Oh, man. We could find them good, okay? So there's times, you know, my brothers and I, we're just messing around and doing stupid stuff and things we shouldn't do, and, and you know, be Mr. Cool and collected, and, and that, but there was a vein. You have, some, you have your dad with a vein? You got the thing? You know, if you watch, watch it, he's had a little receding hairline, you know, and you could see the vein, and you, and you know, if that vein goes, you, you got to clear the area, because he's Mr. Cool and Collective, every, but every now and again, it kind of, kind of comes out, you know, especially around three boys, and, and this is an unauthorized sermon to include, Dad, so I owe you 20 bucks, that's one of the things that we do in, in the Thompson family, but some of us, you know, we, we were raised with that, now, don't put your hands up, but who here is married to a emotion stuffer. Don't put your hands up. Don't put your hands up. Okay. Now, you, you know about this, you know, because maybe you're, you're, you're coming home and, you, and, you, you're, and you, you see your beloved, the, you know, the most precious, beautiful woman in your life, you know, you, and, you, and, you, and, you, and, you, and something looks off and you say to her, honey, you look upset. What's wrong? And you hear, nothing. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, we're just gonna, we have that, right? We've, we, we, some of us were raised where it's just difficult to express our emotions. Um, that's, so that's one category. And, and some of us were also raised in church cultures where we just didn't talk about our emotions very much. Now, uh, my earliest experiences, like r growing up, was in, a, in the United Church of Canada. It was kind of a mainline church. Um, it was one of the older churches of the, of the city. It really valued its music. So it's got pipe organ and a choir. In fact, I didn't really, wasn't totally into because I was a, you know, a 
10-year-old, 11-year-old boy, but, um, but they really valued their music. And, and even in churches that really valued their music, it's so funny, isn't it? Because music is, is designed to be this expression of the heart, right? We, we write music because it's, it's, it's putting sound to emotion, say the poets. You know, but you come into a lot of churches when, it, when you know, it's like, let's, you, you know, you, you, you say, everybody, let's worship. And you say it with the same enthusiasm of like, everybody, let's balance our checkbooks now. This is very important. And it's serious business. And you're going to get this right. My, well, come on. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna carry, that, carry that nine. So open up your, your, your you know, your, your, your song book, your hymn book or whatever, and we're going we're gonna to get every word right. We're going to watch every dot on there so we, that we can do it right. So, but, but worship was, it's important business, but it was just serious business, and it was harder for me to, to kind of understand some of that. And then when I first started to meet Jesus and, and, and realized my import, the importance of having a relationship with Jesus, I ended up... Um, you know, in, the, in another church in town where now they were using guitars and pianos and every now and again a drum set. And so, the, the, you know, at least for me, the instrumentation started to make more sense. We're kind of singing a lot of folk songs. But even there, honestly, the emotional tone didn't change all that much. It was still, worship was still kind of serious business. Like, you know, we, we, we do it. We know it's really important. But it's not something you really put your, like, you know, your emotions are just restrained, right? You understand that? Who, who is raising some of that? Church culture just restrained those things, which is why. When I met my wife's church, she was raised Pentecostal. Any Pentecostal say, you put your hands up because that's what we do, right? Let's get them up there. Hot, come on. There's more than that. There we go. That's right. You're in safe territory here. That's right. I loved it. I, and that was the same instrumentation. In some cases, the same songs. But, oh, man, there's a difference between singing and singing, you know? Like, we're letting it go. And it was kind of kind of cool. It's like my faith kind of came alive. And realizing this, wow, you, you can go to, you go to church and you can get excited? That's fantastic. And I also experienced there what, for some of us, is sort of the second category. Because the first category, remember, is, you know, we suppress our emotions. We don't talk about them. They're, you know, they're, they're there, but mo they're, shh. You know, kind of like icky diseases. We, just, we know they're there, but we don't talk about them too much. Second category is, we, you know, is where there's some emotions that we could express pretty freely. And we're encouraged freely. And so in a Pentecostal church, you know, with celebration and victory and joy and which is great, right? It's fantastic. We had to express those things pretty freely. But I also came to discover that there were some emotions they had a harder time with. Um, it's, had a harder time with expressing things like loss or grief. And maybe you were raised in church environments like that too. Um, you know, something really bad happens. You know, I, you know, I just, I'm going to use a hypothetical just so I don't get too, too personal for anybody. But, you know, you, you come into worship and you're really sad and you're like, you're really sad. What happened? Well, my, 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 my favorite pet just died this morning. And, and they'll kind of look at you and go, well, 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 praise the Lord, you don't need to buy cat litter anymore. You know, like, like, at least, like we just don't know, you don't quite know what to do with it. So you have to put a positive spin on everything. Because it's just hard to understand, like, some emotions are okay, but the, but the icky stuff, the hard stuff, the anger, the grief, the doubt, we just don't talk about that. We don't know what to do with that. So we just layer on more positivity, more victory, more celebration. Some of us were raised in environments like that. Um, and sometimes in those same environments, I also saw this third category, the one that we're, all, we're seeing, and I believe we're seeing, rising in culture more and more and more, which is where emotion also can at times become, th this is now my definition of truth. And what I feel must be true. In church world, you'll sometimes see it a little bit like this. 
well, I, I know I'm really not supposed to do this, but I prayed about it, and I just feel like the Lord's calling me to do that. I, I know I'm not supposed to be, you know, ha- have, having sexual relations with someone I'm not married to, but, you know, I, I prayed about it. And, and I, I, I'm okay with it, you know. We, but we see that, where, where emotion starts to define truth. You know, or, or, or you know, we you see those things with all the suppressed emotions where, you know, you're... Um, well, I'll come back to that. But, but that, there's that, so there's that third category. You know, we've, we've got the first category of we suppress our emotions. Secondly, there's some emotions that are okay. Others we just don't know what to do with. And the third, and I believe this is the rising trend in culture, and probably um, why we're seeing such generational differences in part. I could be wrong on that. Um, but it's one of these big generational differences between the, you know, the get to work, just get it done, come on, you know, put your feelings aside and just do the right thing, come on, show up on time, and to this other culture, this, the, the rise in culture that says, what I feel is who I really am. And we see this in media. I mean, you, you, you watch almost any modern movie. So it could be Disney, it could be Star Wars. I mean, yeah, I love Star Wars. You know, all these things, but there are even Disney, you know? This idea of if you just know your deepest feelings, you'll know who you really are. Trust your feelings, Luke. (laughs) If I know how I really feel, I'll know who I really am. We see that in culture. Increasingly, that definition, and we're not going to have time to go into all of the ramifications. We're going to open up a couple cans of worms here that we'll maybe come back to in later series. I mean, that's everything from your sexual orientation to your gender, to your sense of self-worth. How you feel is who you are, says our culture. So we've seen the pendulum just swinging back and forth. Your feelings don't matter. Some feelings are okay. Others are are not okay. How you feel is who you are. All of those things. Now, you may or may not agree with my cultural analysis, and it's totally okay if you disagree. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. And this is why I wanted us to go into this series and why I wanted us to spend four weeks on the topic of emotions. At the end of the day, I don't want my worldview, including my worldview on emotions, to be mostly shaped by who I am as an American or who I am as a Canadian or even by Western culture or as we're going to come to experience as we go further into the series, by by Greco-Roman foundations. I want the way I view the world to be influenced by Jesus. I want the word of God to be my primary guide. As I, help, as I try to, as I try to get my, my, the, my worldview increasingly aligned with the words of Scripture and the heart of, of our Creator and our Savior, that we, our Redeemer, that we find in this amazing book. Okay? So, if we really hear this passage and we, really, and we explore this topic well, it is going to push all of us. I believe that God's word has something to say. Whether you are, whatever category you were raised in, whether you're part of a suppressor, where it's always head over heart, you want to make a good decision, make an intellectual one, do not make an emotional one, category number one, category number two, it's all kind of mixed up, some are okay, some are not okay, or category number three, if you have to make a decision, always choose your heart over your head, that's, that's, that's the third category. Scripture has something profound to say into all of them. So you with me? You intrigued? I hope so. So, so today we're going to lay a little bit of a foundation um, for emotion, like where emotion comes from and what is it and what are we trying to do with it. And then over the coming weeks, we're going to start looking at some of the emotions that we have a harder time talking about in church. So next week, we're going to talk about grief and then anger. 
And then the third week, we're going to look at, at joy and sadness and, and how, how those two interrelate and work together. So I, I hope, hope you'll be with me on that. Now, so let, let's just start with some of the basics. So where does emotion come from? The Bible tells us emotion ultimately, first and foremost, comes from God. That there is a spiritual component to our emotions. And God, who is spirit, has emotions. So now there's thousands of passages about this. So buckle down. No, we're, gonna, we're, actually, we're just going to do a quick survey. But, but you, you don't, don't believe something just because I say it. You go into the word yourself and study this. But we're going to do a quick survey of some of the emotions that we see in Scripture so starting with the one that is probably, I'm, I'm gladly, thankfully, thank you, Jesus, this is the dominant emotion of God. God feels love. The verse you probably learned about this. Well, let's say this out loud together. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So God feels love. Thank God it's his dominant emotion. God also feels hate. Psalm 11.5 tells us, The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. God feels grief, a regret, Genesis 6.6. 6. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. God feels anger, or um, sometimes translated as wrath. Romans 1.18, the wrath or the anger of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. God feels jealousy, Exodus 20, verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. God also feels joy. We'll end on a positive one, but there's more to it. But. So Isaiah chapter 26, verse 5. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. So God, our creator, God feels emotion. And we are created and made in the image and likeness of God. And so we feel emotion. It, it is, it is a, one of the, an aspect of our spirituality. Now, for God, God's emotions are a... a it's a, it's a spirit, in part at least, a spiritual response to the circumstances around, uh, circumstances surrounding. So when um, God feels anger, anger is our, is our emotional slash spiritual response to injustice. When there is injustice, that's the, uh, it's, it's, the, it's what our emotions communicate. It, it, it helps us to, to have extra degrees of energy to, ag to address that injustice. Now, when, so when God feels an emotion, God feels it in perfect perspective. He, it's directed appropriately and perfectly. And that's where God and us are different. Now, we are his image bearers. We, we experience emotion because we are made in the image and likeness of God. It's, it's part of who you are. It's part of your spirituality. It's part of your makeup. God designed it that way. What an amazing gift. But we are broken image bearers. We, at our very best, we only reflect a portion of, of God's character and design, which is why our emotions are sometimes all, like they're all weird and jumbled up and we, we respond disproportionately. That's why, you know, somebody is really worried about something that's happening at work and then they come home and they yell at their kids. There's anger and fear over here, but it gets misdirected. Right? We've seen that. Or where somebody's feeling grief. Maybe they've just lost a parent or another, a loved one. And then, then immediately they go have an affair. 
He's like, what? What is that? It's misdirected emotion. Our emotions are broken. We are broken image bearers. But our emotions at their core are a gift from God. A gift from God. God designed them. God feels emotion. That's why you feel emotion. Because his, his fingerprint, his image, his stamp is on you. So, so that, that, that's where emotion comes from. So let's start to talk about what do we do with emotion? And let's go to this really foundational passage. And if you've got your paper Bibles out and open, um, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into um, Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. I can all but guarantee you've heard this verse before. But it ends up being so foundational. Okay? So Jesus was once being asked, what is the most important commandment? If you could sum up the whole Old Testament, Jesus, how would you sum it up? Like, they, you know, they're putting Jesus on the spot, asking him weird questions, trying to stump him, and he comes up with something so profound. Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. The great, well, you'll know this one. Yeah, it's on the screen. Now you already know. So Jesus answered, what's the greatest commandment? What's the most important thing to do, Jesus? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your, what? Heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Let's say that one more time. So then we'll go to the second half of the, verse 31. Love, say it together, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is like it. They didn't ask for two. Jesus just gave them two. The second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Okay, now you've heard that before. It's foundational. But this is one of those anchor passages. Here's something you probably hadn't noticed before. Now, um, can we put the, the Mark 5.30 up on the screen? Love the Lord your God. Okay, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your... Okay, okay. Now, so Jesus was quoting Scripture. Now, some of you, you've got your paper Bibles out because you brought your Bible to church because you're super smart, okay? And there's a little footnote in there. Jesus was quoting the Bible. What passage in the Bible was he quoting? Come on. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus didn't, he didn't just make this stuff up. He, he, he had memorized significant, he had significant portions of the Scripture. He knew... What they were. So we're going to take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, and there's going to be something in there that you've probably not noticed before, but it ends up being pretty significant in this conversation. Okay? So let's jump up to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord, say it with me, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your What's missing? Whoa. Hang on here. Are you sure it's missing? Yeah. So did Jesus get it wrong? No. Did Mark record it wrong? No. No. What we find here is, is, a, is, is even in Jesus' time, there's a translational issue. And, and, here, and here's, here's, here's the piece I want to get to. See, um, in the Greco-Roman world, and, and so Jesus at this point is speaking into a Greco-Roman culture. The book of Mark was written in Greek. It was written to the Greeks in, in Greek. In a Greco-Roman culture, they believe something really crazy that we believe too. They actually believe that the head and the heart are separate. They actually believe that. And we do too. You hear this 
all the time. In fact, we operate under this presupposition about this is how we work. We've got our brains and we've got our hearts and sometimes they don't agree. But the Old Testament, the, the, the word for heart, and we're going to learn, we're going to do a couple of nerd things. You, you okay getting a little nerdy with me today? Okay, the nerd things today, in the, def, in the biblical Old Testament definition of heart is fascinating. So the word heart, the word heart shows up as the, as the word, well, you can see it's right to left. What the thing that's actually there is levav. Or, so it's either translated as lev or, or transliter, trans, transliterated when you say it. Anyways, either as lev or levav. Now, when I was in Hebrew class, remembered it this way. You're going to remember this forever, okay? Now, um, what is the Hebrew word for heart? You go, levav, levav, levav. Do that with me. Help me out. Levav, 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 levav. You'll never forget it now. Hebrew word for heart, levav, levav, levav. And, you know, if you've got to learn a lot of Hebrew, you need all the help you can get, okay? So, but the, but the, the important piece to remember here is the, um, the Greco-Roman culture and Hebraic culture not only speak differently, they think differently. And um, in Greek... There is this emphasis on taking everything apart. There's this emphasis on precision. Let's get everything just right, just totally accurate. So as when, you know, as the as the Greeks are thinking about this, even the internal aspects and the emotional aspects and, and intellectual aspects, they would think about the heart and they think about the mind. But not so in the Hebrew. The Hebrew is an integrated faith. Its, it's very orientation is not around how things come apart, but how things fit together. It's a totally different way of looking at the world. The Hebraic concept of heart is, is, is all, all of the insides of you, all of your inner life, your feelings, your, um, your thoughts, the whole shoot and match. In fact, even the Hebrew word for heart, even though it's lavav, 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 it's not even that focused on the organ of the heart. It's like it's all your guts. Now, this doesn't mean that Hebrew, you know, Hebrew people didn't understand human anatomy. It just means that when they were talking about heart and, and the interior life of people, they didn't separate it all out. Your heart, your heart, your whole heart, all that you are, let all that is in me bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my so, well, so, and so you got the, you've got the heart, which is the, which is the summation of all of your inner life, your heart, and your thoughts. You've got your, your soul, you know, the, the nefesh, which is all of your life force. You know, all, like the same word that's used for soul in, in Hebrew is also used for breath and neck. Like all of your, all of your aliveness is your soul. And then all your maod is your strength. All of the things you can do with all of your inner life, when with all of your life force, and with all of your ability, let all that is in me bless his holy name. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your inner world. All your soul, all of your life force, every breath that you breathe, every, you know, the blood going through your body, the aspects of you that are alive. And with all your strength, all your maod, all your capacities, all your abilities, everything that you can do because of all of this. And so for Jesus to translate this concept to a Greco-Roman audience he had to add a word just so they would understand it. Or if, it was, or, or if that change came in with Mark, Mark had to add the word because, because his audience, they didn't understand that this and this are connected, are connected. So when you hear the word heart in the Old Testament, remember that this is the entirety of your insides. 
It's the entirety of your inner life, your heart and your mind, which, which is so weird, isn't it? Because, you know, in our culture, we actually believe it is normal for us to have our hearts say one thing and our heads say the other. We actually believe that's normal. But if you were to ask a Hebrew or, and why this becomes so important for us, to, you know, as, as Christ followers, you know, who want to integrate the emotions well into our life? If you were to ask how God thinks about us, God doesn't make that, or necessarily make that separation. Like when, when you have your heart thinking one thing and your head thinking something else, that in, from a biblical definition standpoint, that is a disordered heart. Or a disordered head. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Put your trust in God. Why is my, why my inner world so messed up? Because my, my emotions and my mind are telling me different things. That's why this concept and what it means to be emotional beings created in the image and likeness of God as broken image bearers is so important because we've got one side of culture that says the head is more important than the heart. Some of us were raised with that. We've got it, we've, they, but you know, we've seen the, the pendulum swing, haven't we? Now we've, and now we've got culture saying your heart is more important than your head. And, and that's why among, I mean, among millions of reasons why we need God's word in our life, we have God's word not taking sides on one or the other. That's how it often is with all the divides we have in culture. God doesn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He came to take a to give us a totally different perspective. And so the, the God's word, even in this fundamental concept, love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's the integration of your thoughts and your emotions together. And when you have a disordered heart, and I believe <laughs> with all my heart, <laughs> we are living in a culture right now of disordered hearts. When we, we find ourselves with disordered hearts, we bring that to the Lord. He is the healer of hearts. Not just, not the organ. Go to your cardiologist for that. Listen to what they have to say. Less salt, all the cool stuff, right? But for the heart, for your lavav. Lavav, lavav, that all that is in me, take that to the Lord. What I hope will be our prayer, and, as a, and I just urge us to spend some time on this together over the next four weeks, however you can connect with this stuff, is, is so we can, we can kind of focus in on this fundamental prayer. God, I want to give you my whole heart. Knowing that when we say that, God, I want to give you my whole heart. It's, it's this, and it's this, and it's all together. Lord, I don't want to live with a disordered heart. So help what I feel to be shaped by what I know is true. And help my emotions to help to inform how I make my decisions. The two must speak to one another. The two must work together. God, I don't want to have a disordered heart. So I'm going to issue a bit of a challenge. Here's what I, I'm going to encourage us to do. And you've got a little, you probably got a little worksheet. So uh, I'm going to talk about the first part of this and then, and then encourage you on your own time to go deeper with the, you know, the other four questions that you see 
below. But to start with this, this, this fundamental one. This, is, this one, because um, to a certain degree, I, I'm, I'm borrowing material from some of, the, some of the folks that I've been learning from. Pete Scazzaro is one of them. Actually, let me just put up a, a do we have that quote? Because I want to just use that quote. But you know, he, he, he writes this, it is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. I believe that's right. It's not, we, even in church, it is, it's not about how many Bible verses you have memorized, though yay if you've memorized Bible verses. It's how do we integrate the truth of God into all that we are as people. God, I give you my whole heart. So I want to encourage us to do this. Uh, at least to, to make, find ways to make this little piece of things a bit of a daily habit. If you were to look at my little, uh, my little uh, prayer journal, which is just, it is, oh my gosh, what a mess. But, uh, but usually somewhere in, which probably tells you something about me. Uh, like all these disordered thoughts, God, you got to help put them together. But somewhere in uh, each day, there's going to be this phrase. Today, or right now, Lord, I am feeling. And then start to list that. Like to add, and, and this is because I'm coming from, that cult, from the culture that tends to favor the head over the heart. I, I'm learning to check in. I'm learning to check in with what's happening here. Right now, Lord, I'm feeling this. And just write some of that out. So you can, whether, whether it's on a, you know, a little journal thing, you keep a little keep note in your phone, or just simply as an as aspect of prayer. God, right now, as I'm coming to you and I'm praying about my day, right now, this is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling anxious. Or I'm feeling depressed. Or I'm feeling pretty relaxed and happy. And then whatever you're feeling, just start to talk to God about that. And then... See what he has to think, and that, that's feeding back. Can you turn that down for a sec? Thanks. Um, so just to take, take that into, into who we are as people. God, would you take this, all this stuff that's going on in my heart, my love, my inner world, help me to understand it better. So that's what we do. That's what I challenge us to do over the next four weeks. We're going to learn to pray about our emotions. We're going to learn to talk to God about our emotions. He gave us our emotions and ask him, God, would you take my disordered heart and help me to make sense of it? So, Lord, I give you my heart. I want to give you my whole heart. Help me figure out how to do that. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you that you are the giver of emotion. Lord, sometimes all this stuff inside of us, it doesn't always feel like a gift. There's some yucky stuff in there. But Lord, we also know that because you gave it, you can help us make sense of it. So, Lord, rather than deny it or suppress it or hope it goes away just because we ignored it, Lord, help us to give it to you. Thank you that you can handle it. God, I want to give you my whole heart. Would you just whisper that prayer with me? If, that, if that's true for you, if that's true for you today, God, I want to give you my whole heart. God, I want to give you my whole heart. Even as we're praying that, for some today, you, you need to be reminded of something in case, you, in case you're not clear on this. As you're talking to God about your heart, you're talking to a God who loves you with his whole heart, who loves you so much that he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you, who, who rose again from the dead for you, who offers you and me and us 
just salvation to anyone who's willing to receive that gift and just reach out to him with a prayer, even that simple, God, I give you my whole heart. God gives it right back. If you're taking a first step of faith today or a reluctant step of faith today, you're seeking today, you're, you're, in, safe, you're in a safe place. Give him your heart. Lord, I want to give you my whole heart. And Lord, we pray that this church and churches everywhere ultimately would be safe places where we can come to you with our disordered hearts, our truly broken hearts. And thank you, God, for meeting us there. Help each one of us to know our part in building that kind of place. We want this place and who we are together to be a place like that. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Invite us to stand and we're going to join together in some, in some song. And I think the kids are going to be coming back and from children's churches as, as, uh, as we do. And then even invite us to prepare for, for communion together. So if for some reason you haven't received a communion packet, you can put your hand up and one of our ushers will get that to you. But let's just, can you, you guys lead, lead us in song? So it looks like we, for whatever reason, we actually don't have the words on the screen. Probably one of our computers crashed. Yay for technology. So I know it's a little bit harder to sing along. So, so why, don't, why don't we just as we prepare to come to the table, we prepare to come to the table. Let's, uh, let's, let's go with something a little bit more basic. I promise you, you know the words to this. So let's sing it together. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus. Come on. Loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Do you have a seat? Take out your communion packets. And so if you're joining us online, hopefully you've got some bread, some juice somewhere, and you can join in with us even from a distance. Here in these elements, we see the very essence of God's heart for us. That even though we would turn our backs on him, we'd ignore him, we'd go our own way, we would tell him to get out of my life, I don't care what you have to say, whether, whether we say that out loud or we say that with our lives, 
rather than God leave us to our own devices. He would intervene out of love. That's why Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, as he is anticipating going to the cross for you, for me, and for us, he would say these, these words to his disciples as he took bread and broke it. Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, remembering me. And that's why as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, whatever form the bread and the cup are in, we proclaim his death until he comes again. I'd invite us to serve one another and, and uh, I don't think we have these things up on the screen. So you're just, you're just going to have to memorize this part. But look somebody in the eye as you partake and say, this is Christ's body given for you. This is Christ's blood. It's shed for you. Lord, thank you that you gave your body and you shed your blood for us. Lord, help us to never forget how much you love us. Meet your people during this time and thank you that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Serve one another in Jesus' name. Way make, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. So let's close with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Invite us to speak them out loud. I trust for many of us, these are words we are already beginning to commit to our hearts. Our hearts. Would you stand with us? And if, you, if you're not yet and at home, you can say these words out loud, okay? We get to do this as a church family, separated by, by borders, separated by state lines, separated by a river. We're in this together, okay? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Hey, just a couple of quick announcements as we're getting ready to uh, head on out. First, I think we're going to be able to put some questions up on the screen. I invite you to take a minute or two, talk to those, talk about those questions. Second thing, next week we're doing two special cool things. One, we're doing a blessing of the bikes. So if you've got a motorcycle, bring it to church. Now, some of you folks, you're going to use this to talk to your significant other about why you've always wanted a motorcycle. You go right ahead and blame me. But if you got a hog, bring it, okay? We're going to do a blessing of the bikes. Secondly, is, uh, is we're going to be doing some, some things with our graduates, honoring our recent graduates. So if there is a graduate that, that especially needs to be honored, make sure that I know about it, okay? I'm in touch with a number of families but I don't want to miss anyone. So help me out because we're going to honor our grads because of the really significant steps they've taken. You with me? Okay. All right. So Lord, as we go from this place, help us to serve you with our whole heart.
We want to give every aspect of who we are to you. Fix the disorder in our heart. We give it to you. Thank you that you can. Thank you that you understand. So Lord, help us to love like Jesus in everything we do as we go from this place. It's in his name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. Love you lots. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. See you soon.